will uh, be education of all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, morning, everyone. And as you know, the more you listen to me, the more you understanding. <laughs> so repeatedly listen to me is, is good and is a must. So you have to listen to me many times. So is it impossible to perform uh, operation without anatomy knowledge? And this is particular to for fistula. And careless surgery lead to uh, failure and maybe I touch it. This is by parts. And you can see in my aura, I will discuss something about the re re in the literature what it say, and I will simplify the anatomy for you. Anatomy in this area is like a blind man and uh, elephant. Someone says something, someone the other order says another thing, and we cannot have the conclusion because we never have a consensus. You see, there are so many authors, big name or a big name, still big name. And you can see their anatomy, drawing is different. They are different all the time. Uh, in the middle is Shafi, once very popular. In every textbook have this picture. But we now know that it's, it's partially correct. <laughs> Is not totally correct. Each of these are partially correct. Maybe Fusini, the last one may be the best. The last one may be the best. And if, if we look closely to the Park's anatomy in his uh, 1961, at the time he proposed, before he proposed the classification, you can see that his understanding of anatomy is not correct at all. He's not correct. So we go further. In my uh, lecture, I will simplify many things for you. Uh, let's say this picture. Do you have a pointer? Uh, this picture, I see circular muscle come down to be internal sphincter. Circular muscle and longitudinal where it is. The longitudinal of the rectum come down in the longitude, you know, of the anus. It never disappear. And you can see the fascia here, come here. So longitude, you know, muscle still longitude, you know. It never to become a conchoid. A conchoid is a misconcept. But no one says so, I said it. Okay? Okay, thank you, thank you. Then we go to the next one. For striated muscle, it's too simplified into three level. I think I try to put this concept to you many times, that are three level or muscle, to better understanding. Okay, thank you for my fellows. Her name is somewhere here, I'll show you later. Huh? You can eat our beautiful picture for me uh, the last two weeks, three weeks. Upper, middle, and lower. We will go in, the, in detail. The upper, yesterday I already explained that it comes from the pubis near the symphysis, attached to the coccyx, distal coccyx, and uh, some uh, uh, sarcum. The river there is one sheet of muscle. And then in the middle, we have, uh, this is one of the key muscles, superficial external sphincter. This is the key muscle. It's go to the posterior and no coccygeal ligament. In the anterior, is a superficial transverse perineal at the same level and perineal membrane. Very thin, very thin muscle. So perineum is under the levator. And subcutaneous and barbous covenosus like this. And we come like this. Very easy. Superficial levator and superficial here. Uh, the upper is the levator, middle is the superficial, transverse, and here, subcutaneous. We, we have to divide into T level like this because, the, in my understanding, and maybe I learned from Eisenhammer, that the abscess and the fistula spread between <coughs> these muscles. They do not pass through the muscle, they just go in between the muscle. 
We can see that very clear when we do the c o s t e r i o r We can see that the fistula go to deep p o s t e n a l space. It's in between the muscle. That is the, the best area to see. But we can see every time. If you know anatomy enough, you can see the fistula pass between the muscle every time. If you are good, at, and nowadays we have ultrasound, and nowadays we have MRI. If the MRI man, uh, radiologist, and the ultrasound man, they pay key attention, they can understand better that the abscess and fistula pass between muscle. Okay, T level like this. T level again. Yesterday you see this. In the ultrasound, there are so T level. At the upper is the t h e b e t a You can see like this. In the middle, you can see the internal and external, and in the lower. Below the internal, you can see right like this the external, T level again. You can see this is from central. I borrow this uh, picture from central, my friend, the Italian guy who is expert in ultrasound. And even the MRI, you can see have T level too, subcutaneous, superficial here, r e v e t a r here. This is not very clear. r e v e t a r in anterior a l w a y s never clear. Because it's very thin, especially in women, we cannot see. For the fascia, yes, we have three important fascia. The fascia that that uh, in the inter s p h i n c t e r p a n e it come from the fascia here, and it come from the fascia of this muscle. Come here and divide all the subcutaneous into many bundle, maybe six to eight, and we can have transversal l i t fascia divide. p e r i a n a l to i s h i o a n a l and i s h i o a n a l fossa fascia divides the i s h i o a n a l to i n f a r i v a t o r but all of this called i s h i o a n a l This is a transversal i s fascia. If we peel out the skin and subcutaneous fat, we can see the transversal i s fascia. If we peel out the transversal i s fascia, we will enter the i s h i o a n a l But if we peel, peel out the issue, remove the issue, you know, fascia, uh, fat, we will see the issue, you know, fossa, fascia divide issue, you know, from super a i n f a r i v a t o r So we cut the issue, you know, fossa, fascia out, and then we reach the l i v a t o r Space cannot explain by one picture. We need to picture to explain all the space. So we have uh, maybe perianal spread. I already told you perianal spread in the anterior between this continuation of the transversal i s fascia and the perineal membrane here. This is called uh, perineal spread. Infection in this spread extend to the scrotum easily. But in clinical, we cannot. Sometimes we cannot separate this from this and from deep one. Cannot. But If you are expert enough, you know that the high time they come to this. I explain more. The inter s p h i n c t e r i c space between the r o n d i t u d i n a l muscle and fascia, inter deep post a n a space between superficial and uh, l i v a t o r a n i and i s h u a n a l space. This picture can explain i s h u a n a l in far l i v a t o r but cannot explain the deep post a n a l space. Cannot. So we need. To picture to explain our space. This is a p e r i a n a l space, and this is sub-Q, and this is superficial, and you can see this is what p e r i a n a l p e r i n e a l space go to the scrotum infection in this. In the in the book, then they were t h e t they pay attention to this space, but this is space very. Very important to understand the spreading to the scrotum. Again, in male, b u l b o s c v e n o s u s spinal c a v e n o s u s and transverse perineal, and you can have superficial perineal spread, and deep one is between this fascia and the l i v a t o r and it, we can deep. It means that uh, inferior l i v a t o r spread can spread to deep perineal spread too. The deep p o s t e n a l space. It is a man-made space. If we dig out the fat, we never see c o r d i n a t space. If we dig the fat out, we never see space. 
we have time, so we move a little bit faster. In fact, the deep pore center space is between superficial and the elevator. It's here, very close to inter sphincteric space. If you look at this picture, skin here, if we cut this skin here, it's the skin. Sub Q, sub Q. Superficial, superficial. Pose in a space, pose in a space. Elevator, elevator. It means that infection from here, when they come here, it means that they come here. Then they can break to here, and then they can break to here to be a complete hot shoe. The abscess here cannot spread to this side. Abscess, this side cannot spread to this side. But abscess in this side can break into one or break into two. We have uh, no time. So this is what the depot center spread of coordinate. Sub swing is a man-made one. This is a correct one. So we need revision. We go to the natural one. This is the natural one. We have the abscess here, abscess here, abscess here. Perianal intersynthetic, perineal spare abscess in the anterior, depot centers in the posterior, issue you know, in the We have abscess in this spare. When the abscess break out, find the way out, we can have low intersynthetic. We can have low trans sphincteric pass to the subcutaneous. And we can have anterior high trans pass above the superficial. And we can have posterior high time go to the post and spread, or just go here and come out without going to the post and spread. And finally, we have add and the other one, high inter swing the superior. It can spread in a circumferential spread to fashion, circumferential fashion too. So this is all natural. But this can mix with it, make compact fistula. This one mix with it many pattern and this one also can be complex if you do not understand enough so for the take home message anatomy of the fistula very simple t level or muscle <laughs> and the natural pattern of inner fistula only row inter swing three row time swing three and three High time swing trick. Post three high time swing trick go to each show, you know, or infrared, and high inter swing trick to superimate, and four and five can mix to be a compact fistula. And that's all very simple. This, this, and maybe compact. If you want to understand compact fistula, maybe next time we, I can show you the mixed variation. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Now, because of what Doc, uh, Professor Arun said, we won't take any questions from the audience, but we ask Dr. Arun to pick up audience and see whether they listen to you. Or not. You, can, you want to ask the audience question? See whether they understand you? <laughs> you don't want to ask them? See whether they, li they are listening to you. Or not. Uh, uh, Dr. Varun, you understand what you say? Are you listening? Can okay, we ask him a question see whether he understands you? <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. No, no, I'm saying that they should ask you questions. You should ask them questions to see whether they are listening to you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We'll go to. Uh, may I call upon the next speaker, uh, Prof. Charles Sun from Singapore. He's going to talk about the pattern of fistula from AUS. Prof. Siam, please. Thank you, uh, Xiao Chun, uh, Dr. Motin. It's always uh, immense, uh, stress, immensely stressful to speak after Professor Arun. And whenever I speak after him, I always have to pay extra attention to all his slides, uh, just in case he changes his concept a little bit. <laughs> and of course, uh, Xiao Chun adds on to the stress by saying that I now must match uh, what I have to say to what uh, Professor Arun has uh, 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 shown us. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to thank two people today. Uh, one is, of course, Professor Arun. When I started learning ultrasounds uh, 25 years or 20 years plus ago, 
um, I must say my understanding of the anal canal was very, very different. Uh, but over the years, listening to him many, many times, uh, I think I hopefully today I will do him some justice uh, and I will crystallize some of his uh, ideas. And of course, uh, thanks to Professor Xiao Chun, when I worked for him in SGH many years ago, he told me actually that I should focus on ultrasound. Um, this is the, is this the right talk? Hold on. Eh? I think this is the wrong uh, slide. Wrong presentation. Pattern, pattern, pattern. It's under patterns. Pattern of fistula from ultrasound. Sorry for the hiccup. It's a pattern of fistula from EUS. Yeah, this, uh, this, this one is the second lecture. Second lecture. The first lecture. Uh, the, other, the other lecture. You got two lectures there, Charles. Put, yeah, two lectures. So the other lecture by Charles would be correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah, or maybe the MRI go first. Is yeah. the radiologist here? Uh, okay, really? Okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> The, okay, the workhorse of, uh, of our ultrasound imaging is the BK machine. We use the Flex Focus uh, 500. Um, when I started doing ultrasounds, this was the main probe that we used. This is actually a uh, axial transducer. Uh, it gives you an image in a 360 degree. And then there's a puller that pulls back the transducer crystal. And then they capture all the images, about 200 over slices and it'll reconstruct into a 3D image. Uh, nowadays, it's a little bit better. We have a linear array probe. This is a newer probe, uh, where you can scan actually in the longitudinal plane. And again, there is a, um, a motor that will spin uh, this flock of transducers 360 degrees, and then you will uh, reconstruct it into a 3D image. Sorry about that. So, as Dr. Aaron showed you, this is the um, images that you get in the upper anal canal. Uh, for the benefit of the residents, you look out for the pubo rectalis muscle, which is a mixed uh, hyperechoic band uh, in a U-shaped manner. Then you know you are in the upper anal canal or the first level, what, what Dr. Aaron said. In the, in the lower uh, mid -anal, ca anal canal, you have the uh, external anal sphincter followed by the internal anal sphincter, which is uh, hypoechoic and uh, the shape is more or less circular. And of course, in the lowermost part of the anal canal, the internal sphincter is missing. You don't see the black ring anymore, and you have this elliptical shape, uh, uh, subcutaneous uh, uh, external anal sphincter. Uh, if you reconstruct nowadays uh, using 3D ultrasound and you look under the coronal uh, plane image, uh, this is using a linear transducer you find that the images correlate very nicely with what you get in the uh, anatomical textbook. So uh, you have the hypoechoic uh, longitudinal muscle uh, coming down in contiguity with the internal uh, uh, sphincter. And then you also have this uh, longitudinal uh, fascia fibers. Uh, uh, and the, fiber, the fascia fibers here will split the uh, subcutaneous uh, anal sphincter. And round about here, you will have the uh, superficial uh, 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 external sphincter, and this is of course the uh, uh, pubic rectalis in contiguity with the uh, levator plate going up around to the pelvic uh, uh, floor. Uh, Dr. Arun was very kind to give me this slide, uh, and this is how he uh, would classify or describe the different uh, uh, types of abscesses that you will see uh, from the high intersphincter extension, you get a supralevator. This is the infralevator, ischioanal, intersphincter abscesses, 
The deep post anal space abscesses is over here, which we'll see in a sagittal view. Of course, you have the intersphincter abscess, and if you come out to the superficial, uh, underneath the skin, you get the perianal abscesses. Uh, this is uh, what an intersphincteric abscess will look like. You can see uh, between the internal sphincter, which is uh, hypoechoic, and the external sphincter, there is a collection of fluid uh, between the two uh, uh, muscles. This is round about in the mid-anal canal. Uh, if I were to show you a uh, recon uh, in a 3D view uh, along the uh, longitudinal plane, uh, this is the longitudinal muscle. Uh, you can see this collection of fluid lying between the internal sphincter and the external sphincter. So this is a uh, intersphincter abscess. It hasn't quite uh, gone out into the perianal region. You can see this is the uh, subcutaneous anal sphincter as uh, demarcated by the uh, fascia fibers uh, splitting it. Um, this is a patient who presented with uh, severe anal pain. As you can see, uh, there is a collection of fluid uh, 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 posteriorly over here. And this is what we will term a, a horseshoe collection. If you look on the longitudinal plane, uh, again, the landmarks will be the long internal sphincter, uh, hypoechoic here. This is the external, the subcutaneous. You will see a collection of pus on either side. And over here, it breaks into the uh, left ischioanal space, and hence you will get a ischioanal abscess. So as th what Dr. Arun mentioned just now, if the infection were in the deep postanal space, it's very easy for the abscess to break in either direction into the apices of the ischioanal fossa. And of course, uh, in this case, on the left side, it extends right through towards the skin. But interestingly, you can also see here that if this is the intersphin uh, internal sphincter and the longitudinal uh, uh, muscle, and if you can make out this is probably the levator plate, there is also extension of the abscess going up uh, into the superlevator uh, area, and this will be an intersphincteric, high intersphincteric abscess, also forming a horseshoe uh, posteriorly on either side. So this is the same patient, uh, but a different uh, plane of cut. You can see uh, over here, this will be the deep post anal abscess. Uh, let me see, it's not too bright here. This is probably the uh, intersphincteric, uh, high intersphincteric co collection. This is where the levator plate will come in, uh, deep post anal space. If you look uh, from the bottom up, this is the anterior and this posteriorly, this is where the coccyx is. You can see this collection of fluid forming a horseshoe infralevator extension as well. So this is the uh, right infralevator extension. This is the left. And of course, there's one more extension that comes out into the ischioanal region. And of course, we won't be able to see the uh, horseshoe extensions on the other side. So you, 3D ultrasound allows you to look at the anal canal, the surrounding spaces in multiple uh, directions. And of course, we elected to treat the to train this patient with a, uh, with a, with a series of uh, cetons. Um, okay, this is another patient. You can see uh, the key here is the look for the internal sphincter. You can make out a little bit of the internal sphincter here, uh, external sphincter. There is a collection of fluid in the uh, uh, ischioanal space. Uh, this is in the distal third of the anal canal. You can see elliptical shaped external sphincter. You can see uh, superficially there is a collection of pus in the left ischial anal uh, space, uh, tracking anteriorly. Uh, if you go higher up, it curves, starts to move posteriorly. And in the uh, upper anal canal uh, with the uh, pubo rectalis over here, you can see it meets with a deep post anal collection. Uh, if you go even higher up, you will see the uh, infralevator uh, extensions on either side. So again, if you were to do a, a multiplanar reconstruction, uh, this is the uh, external, uh, sub subcutaneous uh, external sphincter. This is near the anal verge. You can see the collection of uh, fluid tracking anteriorly. And then uh, going up towards the apex of the ischial anal space, and then here he meets the deep post anal space over here. Uh, you can see the infralevator collections on either side. Uh, this 
wasting here demarcates where the rectum will meet the anal canal, and this is where the levator plate is. Uh, okay. Did, did I lose anybody? Okay. So again, uh, we like to drain all this uh, complex uh, abscesses with uh, cetons first before we deal with the uh, fistula later. Uh, this is a more simple one. This is a uh, intersphincteric abscess. You can see a collection of fluid between the internal sphincter and the external sphincter, uh, as shown here. Uh, and in the uh, recon view, uh, longitudinally, on a sagittal view, you can see a collection of fluid between the internal sphincter and the external sphincter, uh, almost pointing into the perianal region. And this is very straightforward. You can see pointing, so we will just uh, drain this and lay open the, the, the fistula. Uh, Dr. Arun has showed you this in his uh, closing slide. And this is what uh, he thinks the different types of uh, fistula would be. You can have the low transphincteric or the intersphincteric. Uh, anteriorly, it will be high. You have the high intersphincteric extension. And of course, posteriorly at 6 o'clock, it always goes uh, into the ischioanal uh, uh, space. Uh, I won't go into this. Uh, OK, so this is a uh, anterior transphincteric uh, anal fistula. This is anterior, this is posteriorly. Uh, here we have highlighted the external opening uh, or the fistula tract with hydrogen peroxide. Uh, and you can see the uh, peroxide in the mid anal canal uh, transversing the, uh, internal the external sphincter, uh, breaching the internal sphincter over here into the subepithelial space. Uh, in the upper anal canal, which is demarcated by the pubo rectalis, uh, you can see that uh, there is no uh, peroxide enhancement. Uh, this is a colorful slide because we decided to uh, uh, do a Doppler study as well. Uh, so as you can see uh, in the patient in the prone jackknife position, this is the external opening. You can see the uh, intersphincteric portion of the fistula tract over here. And we normally will deal with it uh, with the lift uh, technique. Um, this is a low transphincteric tract with a high intersphincteric extension. Uh, again, in the distal portion of the anal canal, internal sphincter is missing. You only see the external sphincter. If you move higher up, you make out the internal sphincter, which is a black circular ring, and you can see peroxide enhancement uh, breaching the ring. Uh, Doug Douglas Wong, who taught me ultrasound, says that once you have a breach in the uh, internal sphincter, uh, that would meet the criteria of an internal opening. Uh, but if you go out higher up into the upper part of the mid anal canal, almost close to the pubic rectalis, you still see peroxide enhancement, but the internal sphincter here is uh, intact. So there is an uh, intersphincteric extension, as shown uh, here in the uh, uh, tangential longitudinal recon. You can see the peroxide enhancing the tract. Uh, there is a breach in the subepithelial space, so this is the internal opening. But the tract also goes further up, and this is the high intersphincteric uh, extension. Uh, again, uh, we use the lift technique to deal with this. Uh, this is an anterior transphincteric tract uh, with a perineal extension. Uh, you can see um, over here, uh, this is the uh, distal anal canal, uh, the, the starting to make out the internal sphincter a little bit, uh, but not very clear. This is the upper anal canal. Um, because it extends in the perineum close to the scrotum, this is beyond the range of our usual 2052 or 8838 probe. So here we have to use a surface probe. We can see uh, there is a collection of fluid uh, in the perineum near the scrotum. Uh, and then this is where the hyperechoic tract will come in contact with the internal sphincter uh, anteriorly. This is the internal sphincter uh, uh, posteriorly, and this is the subcutaneous uh, uh, anal sphincter fibers. So again, you can see a uh, collection, a swelling here near the base of the scrotum. Uh, and here, you, once we have drained it, you can, the, with the probe in, you can see it comes into the intersphincteric portion of the tract, which we have divided, and we have done the lift uh, uh, technique here. Uh, the same lady whom I showed you much earlier with the complicated abscess uh, and we treated with a ceton. This is the interval scan uh, uh, two months later. You can see that the ischioanal abscess has mostly resolved. 
So has the high interspintetic horseshoe collections over here. Uh, what you are left with is a little bit of a shadow posteriorly in the upper inner canal, just as it extends into the apex of the left uh, ischial anal fossa. So most of the abscess has been adequately drained uh, and uh, sepsis uh, well controlled. So what you're left with is dealing with the fistula. Again, we inject hydrogen peroxide through the external openings. You can see uh, peroxide enhancement within the tract. Uh, all this is scar tissue. Uh, the intersphincteric collection has resolved. Uh, you can see peroxide enhancing from ischial anal to the posterior, posteriorly to the deep post anal space. And this is the posterior ceton. This is the ischial anal ceton. A little bit of the uh, uh, infralevator uh, uh, tract over here. So uh, we treated this with the endorectal advancement flap, uh, which we then uh, closed the internal opening. Uh, this is what a low intersphincteric fistula will look like. You can see uh, in the past with the older 2052 probe, you don't get the resolution, but here you can see the proxy enhancement very nicely going in between the internal as well as the external anal sphincter here. So this is the intersphincteric fistula. Uh, just to close with my last slide, this is the uh, old description of the suprasphincteric fistula. And I can understand why uh, uh, Parks would call this a suprasphincteric fistula. Uh, if you were to cut a 3D image of the anal canal tangentially, and this vertical line here demarks the six o'clock position, you can see that infection usually will start posteriorly at six o'clock. It goes up in the intersphincteric space, and then after that, it cuts into the ischial anal space coming down like this. So this U-shaped high takeoff point would look as though it is a suprasphincteric fistula in a two-dimensional view, but in fact, it's actually a high transphincteric with everything below the levator plate. So in summary, Endoanal ultrasound allows for accurate preoperative uh, imaging of the abscesses and fistula. Uh, we have found that it correlates very accurately with operative findings. It allows us to assess the sphincter integrity, especially in patients who have multiple surgeries. We always use hydrogen peroxide. When we do the lift uh, uh, procedure as a lift practitioner, I find that it's essential to help us locate the intersphincteric portion of the tract and here helps us cite the incision. The patterns that we have elicited on ultrasound is consistent with that proposed by Professor Arun. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, next um, we have patterns of fistula from magnetic resonance imaging. Um, we have the radiologist from Cholong Kong University. Unfortunately, they don't have a name here. Uh, I'm very sorry, but uh, can you introduce yourself? We don't have your name on this, on this uh, timetable. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to see you, everybody. Firstly, I would like to give my special thanks to uh, Professor Arun and Jula Longkorn, Coroectal Department, for giving me this opportunity to be the part of this program.
Uh, we just say that we are running quite short of time, so I don't think you have any questions. Uh. Uh, that will help everybody because otherwise Arun going to question everybody, see whether they're listening to him. <laughs> just to save you all from his questioning. <laughs> anyway, we, we, we're supposed to end this session at 11.20. It's already now 11.50. So we should just carry on after. How is it? Is it okay? Charles, may I ask you some question? Do you use uh, endo and autosol during the operation for the abscess or fistula? Um, in, in our practice, we have uh, ultrasound machines in all our clinics. So um, if we see the patient in the clinic first, then they all get scans. Uh, so by the time we reach the OT, we already know what we are dealing with. Uh, but of course, if the patient is goes straight to the operating theater, we, we can push the machine uh, down to the uh, OT. Uh, but not routinely, we scan them in the operating room. We, we do all our scans uh, pre-operatively. Uh, mainly because I think also in, in, in Singapore, Francis will, will allude to this, in Singapore, we are, we are facing a more um, increasingly more uh, hostile uh, legal climate. And so informed consent becomes uh, very, very tricky. Uh, so um, in that sense, we try to get maximum information first. And then we have a very uh, detailed discussion on the options with patients before we bring the patient to OT. Otherwise, if you were to scan in the OT and then you get caught with a with an with a un, unexpected uh, situation, uh, then your options become uh, much more limited. Uh, yeah. Good morning, Prof. Um, my name is Aini. I'm one of the uh, collector fellow current from Malaysia. Who's currently in uh, Chula for the last uh, four months. Um, I just want to ask regarding one of your, the the case that you showed the lady with the anterior high trans that goes into the perineum. I know you did um, that a uh, lift on the perineal side, but how normally you deal with the distal tract, especially for the lady, and uh, do you normally um, have an adjunct um, sphincter sphincter um, repair? to make sure that patient do not have incontinence, number one. Number two, do you have any problem with the prob this kind of patient with uh, consequently having rectal vaginal fistula? I think in, in, uh, if, you're talking, if we are talking about the same uh, patient, I don't, uh, I don't call out I don't core out the tract uh, uh, anteriorly uh, for females, uh, probably for the same reasons that you have alluded to. 
um, because the perineal body is, is quite important. Uh, in the male patient, then it's a little bit different. Uh, I think uh, increasingly, if the tract is very long, uh, I would probably uh, uh, excise the whole tract all the way to the sphincters and then close the wound uh, primarily. And I think uh, uh, Professor Arun and I had a few discussions. You, you also tend to excise the whole tract nowadays because we find that that is problematic in, in, in healing. Um, so far, I have not had a situation with rectal vagina fistulas uh, because most of the uh, fistulas being cryptoglandular in origin don't really extend to the RV septum because that's another uh, area altogether. So you, sh you shouldn't really have to deal with it. The only situation is, which is very unusual uh, is in a patient with an occult obstetric sphincter injury with a deficient perineal body now presenting with an anal fistula. Uh, and, and fortunately, I've not had one so far, uh, but I would deal with the fistula probably in the same way, using a lift, and probably at the same time repair the uh, anal sphincter. So the, the plication and the imbrication will bring uh, vascularized uh, muscle tissue into the space, and that should uh, solve your fistula. Uh, okay, thank you, Charles. We get, get on with the MRI lecture. Okay, finally, let's start. Okay, I have nothing to disclose. And to start, I will talk about the anatomy of anal canal shortly because you can understand MRI of anal fissure correctly if you don't know about anatomy. Okay, and I'm going to give you a very quick definition about active and chronic tear and also abscess. And then we're gonna hear about pattern of anal fistula and some examples. Last but not least, I will give you a structural reporting system. Okay, okay it's so crucial that imaging plane should correctly align with respect to anal canal. So we do the coronal and axial plane parallel and orthogonal to anal canal. Okay, on... Axial, this is a coronal oblique, and this is an axial oblique, T2. And on axial oblique, we can see the external sphincter nicely at outer more circular layer, and also longitudinal muscle, which continues from the longitudinal muscle of the rectum. And we can see internal sphincter like a donut shape. If we do straight coronal and axial planes. We cannot see all of this muscle in the true plane of an anal canal. So the anatomy of the muscle will be distorted like this. Okay. And this is the coronal T2 and T1 with facial passion with gadolinum injection. We can see the, the, the levator in a nicely continue to thicken part of pure rectolith muscle and superficial external sphincter and subcutaneous, subcutaneous external sphincter, which is uh, an, like an annular muscle lines in flow lateral to internal, sphincter, inter, to internal sphincter. Okay, for the high transfixeric fistula tract, the fistula tract are uh, passed between superficial external sphincter and levator in eye muscle. And for the low transfinteric fistula tract, the track uh, passed be, uh, below a uh, superficial external sphincter, okay? And in the inner part of uh, you can see uh, relatively hyper intense compared to external sphincter. The internal sphincter will enhance after contrast injection. And these are perianal space and each your anal space and uh, infra levator space. Uh, the intersphincteric space seen lateral to longitudinal muscle. And you can see the longitudinal muscle continuing from the outer layer of the rectum. Okay, and this is sagittal T2 in three consecutive slides. Okay, we learn uh, about three level of anogenital muscle previously. And this is our uh, upper, middle, and lower level. Okay, and you can see levator ani here. And then, 
superficial external sphincter on posterior and subcutaneous external sphincter here. And these are infra and supra levator space, inferior and superior to levator ani muscle. Okay. And this is area of the post anal space lying superior to superficial external sphincter. Like this, okay. And to locate internal and external opening, we use the anal clock scheme. So because of the tension lies to pie position, so the left side is three o'clock and the lateral aspect is nine o'clock and anterior perineum is located at uh, 12 o'clock and natal cleft is at six o'clock. So we will identify the active and chronic tract, okay? And for the normal sphincter on T2, this is a T2, sagittal T2 and post get On T2, the muscle or sphincter will low signal or black or on image. Whereas the active tract, granulation tissue and abscess have high signal or white, okay? T2 will provide a good contrast between hyperintense fluid inside and hypointense fibrous wall outside. And active tract uh, will enhance after gadolinium injection because generation tissue. And for the chronic tract, uh, show, oh, sorry, sorry. For the chronic tract, it shows low signal intensity on T2 image. And you can see my enhancement of the tract from the fibrous tissue. And for the abscess, uh, abscess also show area of high signal intensity on T2 image. And there is a, but it will show rim enhancement on post get injection and central area of low signal intensity that not enhanced. And there is a tiny focus of signal void on at the non-dependent part of the abscess. Is air or gas? For imaging interpretation, we have to first detection of the perianal fistula and uh, is this tract active or not? Identify internal opening at anal canal or lower rectum and the pattern of perianal fistula and then external opening. I know you can see it better on physical examination and identify secondary tract and abscess if it has. Uh, we learned previously from the excellent lecture from Professor Arun about five natural patterns of anal fistula. So I will skip this. For the recording system uh, that generates by Professor Arun, we will start with our internal opening from anal clock position, and then which is the type of fistula when it passes in the sphincter in the sphincteric space, is it an abscess, cavity, or tract? But in my opinion, it is so difficult to identify the cavity because the granulation tissue will enhance like a fistula tract, okay? So I will only identify abscess and tract. And we will classify the level of fistula in the intersphincteric or low or high transphincteric. After that, uh, which space does the fistula, go to, fistula tract go to? Perianal space, perineum space, that means uh, fistula tract uh, extend anteriorly, okay? And the post-anal space, ischio anal space, infra or supra levator space, and for the end, we will identify the, the external opening, if it doesn't have external opening, I will, we will call it blind track. And if it extends to uh, anal canal, open to anal canal or low rectum, again, we will call secondary internal opening. And for the last column, we will measure the track length from internal to external opening. And, okay, let's start with the first case. A uh, 53 years old male with a uh, FIA sent for evaluation. 
This is coronality to fat suppression image, okay? There is an uh, internal opening at uh, 6 o'clock of anal canal, extending downward into intersphincteric space, and with external opening at uh, 12 o'clock without passing through subcutaneous external sphincter. On sagittal T2, we can see hyper-intense tract from posterior to anterior direction. Okay, and on axial T2 with fat suppression, we can see the hyper-intense tract at intersphincter. We can see the hyper-intense tract that intersphincter express and with external opening about 12 o'clock. So from this, our recording system starts with IO6 and then go to intersphincter space with a track uh, at the level of intersphincter space and, and at external opening at 12 and this time about 3.4 centimeter. For the second case, uh, there's a 20-year-old male with anal pain to rule out uh, intersphincteric abscess. This is a uh, this is sagittal T2 of the patient. This is anterior aspect, and this is a posterior aspect of the patient. There is an internal opening at six o'clock. That is a posterior of anal canal with a horseshoe abscess in intersphincteric space from two, 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 uh, 12 to 2 o'clock, okay, like this, and there is no external opening. After gadolinium injection, you can see nicely for uh, rim enhancement without internal enhancement. From our report, we will start with uh, internal opening at uh, 5 or 6 o'clock, and then it's from the abscess at level of intersphincter space, okay, without external opening. Okay, for the third case, a uh, uh, 42 year old male with a uh, fistula in anal post IND to evaluation, okay. And this is a sagittal T2 of uh, the patient and it's post gadolinium image on sagittal plane. Okay, we can see internal opening at uh, 12 o'clock on anterior aspect and then the fistula tract pass in the sphincteric space anteriorly and inferiorly and, and then open at a uh, Okay, it passed anteriorly inferior to superficial external sphincter and with external opening at about 11 o'clock. Okay, there is two area of dark signal for sign of air from prior IND. So we will not call it like an abscess, okay? And we start with IO12, and this is like a cavity or track, okay? Because it's like a wide track. And then it passed to anterior low transphincter uh, extension and passed to perineal space like a track. Opening at EO11. Okay, I will pass this case, but I want to show, because it's the same, but I want to show the, uh, internal, the internal opening at 12 o'clock nicely seen on post gadolinium image. Okay. Okay, for the case five, uh, 26 year old male with complex uh, fistula in anal post then drainage. This is a more complex case. First, okay, it will be complicated, okay. First, on sagittal T2, this is sagittal T2 and post get this coronal T2 and coronal post get We start uh, with uh, internal opening at 6 o'clock of anal canal and then goes to intersphincter space, and this is a post, deep post anal space, seen as the cavity or abscess. And then it extends posteriorly to the right buttock with rim enhancement. Okay, for the second track, it's 
it goes up along high intersync inter space and then forming abscess at infra elevator space. You can see uh, levator A9 here as superiorly to the abscess. Okay. And for the third track, it uh, from, originates from 6 o'clock to, and then extending right each or inner space in anterior direction with external opening at 12 o'clock. Uh, this track is quite large, but uh, on postcat it shows intense enhancement without filling defect. So you can see linear hyposignal from Seaton drainage here. Okay. So we have uh, three row in this from six o'clock, uh, all from IO6 and then go to like an abscess uh, at level of high transphenolic level to the post in our space and opening at six and seven o'clock. And the second track that is uh, like an abscess uh, at the level of high intersynthetic space and goes to infra elevator space like an abscess. Uh, that is the Ennis blind track. And for the third one, you see the track is a high transfinitary on the right side of each or inner fossa and opening at 12 o'clock. Okay, the last case. First, uh, on surgical T2, we can see internal opening at 6 o'clock of inner canal for the origin. And then this is coronal T2. Okay, this track called uh, this had caused superior to superficial external sphincter into right each or inner space and then external opening on the right posteriorly. And then from internal opening, this is this track go upward to the left high trans high intersynthetic space with supra elevator extension with secondary internal opening at three o'clock of low rectum, like this uh, diagram. You can see from this uh, to high trans to here and extend interswing, high interswinter space to, with supra elevator extension to lower rectum. Okay. For my table, there is IO6, and then like a track at, on the right side of each or inner space, external opening at eight o'clock, and then uh, there is a secondary track at the level of high in the space space uh, with a supra elevator extension with an at a secondary internal opening at three o'clock. So this is an axial T2, this is the same case. I will show axial T2. This is an internal opening at six o'clock and then extend in the synthetic space. And with the secondary internal opening at six, at three o'clock. Okay, for take home message, or MRI provide accurate information for appropriate surgical treatment and reducing recurrent rate and side effects, such as fecal incontinence. And you have to look at three planes for evaluating perianal fistula correctly. Five patterns of uh, natural anal sepsis uh, facilitate MR imaging interpretation. For the recording system, will promote efficient communication between radiologists and surgeon. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've been informed by organizers that we'll have 10 minutes of questions, after which we will have lunch, and we'll have session nine after lunch. So perhaps we can ask the uh, three speakers to come to the front and sit on the stage so that we can have some questions.
Yes, uh, I would like to ask Prof. Lun, what is the cut point of the cavity and fistula tract? <laughs> in, in fact, no, no. It by clinical, we can separate the tract because we put a probe in and cannot move. And if we put a tract and we can move right in the cavity, that's a cavity, very, very, very different. And when during the operation, if we go cut and the abscess come out, that's the abscess. But for the imaging study, sometimes they can know only cavity or tract because tract is small, cavity is big. Uh, but we do not have a, a space, maybe two millimeter or three millimeter, I don't know. Maybe, which one? Yeah, we, we had a quick discussion before and uh, uh, on ultrasound, basically if you have a tract, there's a well-found fibrosis around the, the, the fistula. So the peroxide enhancement is very contained. So it's a very nice tract that you see. In the cavity, there's diffusion. So the peroxide will run all over the place. And then you get a lot of imaging artifacts. Um, so once we see uh, diffusion of peroxide all over in different areas, uh, then it, the tract is not matured. And, and when we do lift procedures, whenever we see that there's a diffusion of peroxide, we know that the fistula tract is not mature enough. Uh, some people will, will, will hold off and maybe do a C-torn. I don't know whether Prof. Arun has any comments on that. Actually, there are some papers talk about this. Uh, for the cavity, is about three millimeter wide, and for the for the abscess, it's about one centimeter in size. Uh, she she did a good job, but <laughs> she put the recording system with I call fistula map. I think it's new to most of us, together with the MRI. So make a little bit confusing, but if you understand it, it will be much more easier to understand fistula. But a new thing, anything new, sometimes get a little bit uh, puzzle. Okay, but finally, this just come out last two weeks, the inner fistula map. So it's difficult for all the room because it's new thing. Uh, Dr. Dr. Arun, I want to ask you a question. And that is, you know, um, for the older people uh, where in treating inner fistula, where clinical examination, where the use of probes, where the use of injection, where the use of fingers are very important, uh, do you think that MRI or ultrasound actually supersedes this? Of course, if you have it, you're using it. But uh, you think that a person can effectively use clinical skills and clinical examination uh, to treat without the use of ultrasound and MRI? Yes, of course, simple one, you can feel the track. I think in my practice, I do not need the MRI. And for a complex one, is it, we can feel some thickening at the elevator, or we can uh, see many holes or something like this. I myself, sometimes I do not send for the MRI because I know what it is. But I would like to recommend all of you to use MRI or ultrasound so that you can learn. Otherwise, it's difficult in some case, even with operation, even with uh, sometimes maybe we cut it, it's the best, the best thing to see. Pavet maybe understand better than any other person in the room about the, the, the type of fistula because he open all. But with some limitation, if he uses some technique like a leaf, like a season, sometimes we do not know exactly what it is. But <laughs> even with the MRI or the other sound, Many times the radiologists report incorrect. They report different from our finding. Yes. But I know she is not incorrect. But MRI is correct. But in the radiologist is not correct. MRI always correct. <laughs> so if you have MRI in combination with the operative finding, back and forth, back and forth, finally you get the real one. Or a very good Radiologist 
Larry misunderstand or uh, Larry misreport incorrect thing. So you need most of the time they will report correctly, but few cases not correct. Doctor, I want to ask a question. Okay, I have two questions. One go for uh, Charles, another one to the lady. Let's just start with Charles. Uh, I know hydrogen peroxide enhancement is very helpful, but what if the patient does not have external openings or the external opening is closed? Any trip or tricks to see the, the tracks? Um, if, if the external opening has just closed, then usually what we do is we will open it in the clinic. It's, it's actually a superficial... Uh, uh, thing you, and they won't feel it because the the blunt cannula can just perforate the skin and they won't feel anything. Uh, but sometimes the 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 thing has closed off completely. Then you can't inject peroxide. So then we have to rely on uh, just uh, uh, the hypoechoic uh, scar tissue, and and uh, infer from that that that's probably where the fistula is. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's not perfect. Yeah. And additional questions to this. Uh, in case of recurrent fistula, uh, can you, how can you differentiate the, the fistula and the fibrotic scar? Yeah. So, so again, if we don't have uh, if we don't have peroxide, it becomes challenging. Then, in this situation, we will fall back on the MRI because MRI has advantages here because of the uh, contrast and uh, the way they, they run the sequence. You can actually differentiate between uh, fluid. And, and scar tissue. I, I'm, am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So it's good because I will continue with the questions. That is there any limitations for MRI? Uh, so far, we think the MRI is a gold standard of the preoperative imaging. Is there any limitations for MRI? Okay. Uh, for the example that uh, if the patient has uh, multiple operation, it has to see the track properly because uh, the the internal the external filter will be destroyed from prior surgery. So we can call we can't call it a low or high track uh, properly. And the second is about the the abscess cavity and some track differentiation, like I said before. Uh, I would just like to comment here about uh, you asked Francis whether it's necessary to do MRI or this in every case. The answer is no, it's not necessary. If you're doing a conserv conservative surgery like the lift, you really don't know, you want to know beforehand what are the tracks or abscesses which are there associated because not everything can be palpated from outside. In which case you would need. I do a fistulectomy, so there everything is open. I can see under vision what I'm doing. So really, I, in my hands, I don't need it. So it also depends on what procedure you're going to do. And because even after saying, if you're doing a lift, you want to see three months later on whether it's healed or not, because externally, you really sometimes cannot make out what's happening inside. Then you may need a follow-up MRI to see what's happening inside. So that would be the indication. And uh, to answer Varut's question about the limitations of MRI, one indication, one limitation is if the tract is going uh, interspheneric high supraelevated to the preperitoneal space, then the MRI would not suffice and you would need an additional CT scan for the abdomen to see uh, the spread into the anterior abdominal wall. Yeah, the other question I want to just ask here very quickly, we have one minute and a half to go, uh, is because Charles talking about CETON uh, prior to um, lift procedure. Now in my experience, I find that the use of CETON actually makes lift more difficult because often the CETON makes the internal opening very wide and then becomes not, not fibrotic but actually very um, easily torn when you're trying to tie off the lift, uh, the, the, the lift track. So I just want to ask Dr. Arun what he thinks of the CETON in this, in, because it's not my experience that CETON helps. In fact, it's my experience that CETON makes it worse harder to do a, lift, a proper lift procedure? Uh, actually, just to clarify, Sao Chun, I, I just said that we drain it with a CETON, but I actually didn't say which procedure we use uh, next. Uh, and we do have a paper comparing lift and flaps after CETONs. But I'll let Arun uh, answer the question first. The CETON, I do not use CETON to pass allow the muscle. But I believe, I believe that a good CETON may help in some special case. It means that even uh, an abscess, I use lift 
without any problems. Healing rate approach 90% of the abscess. It's a little bit better than the fistula because the cavity collapsed much better than the fistula. So, but be careful for the season. I have seen many, many season come from others. They use season even for very low fistula. And they use season when the fistula is a little bit high, away in the long position. The internal is there, but they put the season far away from the real primary opening. They make a secondary opening most of the time. And how many fistula have come from Europe? Every patient have season. Every patient from Europe have season. But I think 50, 60 percent of cases is wrong season. That come to me. Those patients that come to me, it's wrong pace. But I think it's overused first. Second, it's, it's practiced by by who is not expert in the fistula. But the season, a good season for some special case is help. I, I think it's help. I think in the US and Europe, the first surgery always is examination and anesthesia with sit-on placement. That is how I think most, that's what I've seen patients who come from the yeah. US and Europe. First surgery is always, whether it's an abscess or whether it's actually a fistula also, they will still pass a sit-on first, examination and anesthesia. And I fail to understand what, what additional information would they get to examination and anesthesia. You have an MRI, you have a 3D ultrasound, you have a clinical examination. So I don't I didn't understand why, what additional information you would do. I'll tell you what it is. It is called delay procedure. Yeah, delayed procedure. So now we don't delay anymore because lunch is here. So we shall go for lunch and we will postpone... I want to up away because he have more experience than all of us here. Uh, I already told the floor that the season from Europe away not a good <laughs> season. It's all, uh, maybe fifty percent is the wrong place. In your experience, the season from Europe, uh, in your in your in your finding, in your experience, uh, would you please tell me the quality of the season from Europe? In your, in your experience. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean... Most of the patients who actually I saw, they didn't need sit-on because as he rightly said, they were low fistulas. They were low transventric fistulas and they were passed. I was wondering, one person had a OTC uh, you know, a clip for a low transventric fistula. So it was a simple surgery made difficult because of the, as you said, you know, the passing sit on to the, not into the right plane and creating additional tracks actually made the surgery worse, uh, made the fistula worse than what it was originally, actually. Okay, we have to stop this session, I think, you know. Uh, so, Sir Chun, Sir Chun, yeah. just, Sir Chun, just one last, no, one last I, comment. <laughs> just one last comment. In, for the benefit, for those of you, these are the best MRI pictures I've seen uh, for anal fistulas. And I think the learning point is that these are special protocols because you, I don't want you to go back and just order MRI pelvis or MRI rectum. You have to order MRI anal fistula protocol and cut it the way she did it. She had the benefit of learning from Arun. So not all MRIs are equal. So it's how you run the protocols. Otherwise, the images are, are, are not meaningful. That's the only comment I'll make. Only one shot, one shot, one shot. Uh, give give, give uh, advice to the floor. Uh, if you want to use the sedan, you must be very careful. Do never force to put the sedan. And if you do not, uh, uh, if you do not uh, sure that this is the right one, just put a tube then. Just put a tube then. It's safer than the sedan. I, it means that most of the sedan practice today is known of one overuse. Second, poor quality. Sitan may do harm to the patient. In my understanding, Sitan do harm because we are not good. In fact, Sitan is good, but because we do harm, because we are not good Sitan user. My, my opinion to that, Professor Arun, is if you can put a Sitan in the right place, the patient doesn't need a Sitan. If you cannot put a Sitan in, then, you know, uh, you put a Sitan in, then there will be a wrong place. So if, if you can find the right opening, you don't need a sit-on.
guys. We'll let's thank the speakers in the usual manner. <laughs> Thank you very much, our moderators and our speakers. And it's time for lunch. And lunch will be served at the same canteen that you have eaten. And um, please be back at the...